hello everyone so in the uh, we have seen uh, in the last lecture we saw about uh, we learned how to read the design uh, into design compiler we studied some coding techniques uh, we we saw actually so uh, let's just look a spend a few minutes at this token so we have seen library uh, a couple of lectures back Uh, we saw what link target and synthetic library mean. Library mean. In the last lecture, we saw how to read the deadlock into design compiler. We saw how to code RTL for synthesis. Now, in this lecture, uh, we look at how to define the design environment. Before we come to the more most important part of setting the design constraint, we uh, should see. How the environment is designed? In what environment we synthesize the design? Uh, so this uh, presentation is divided into two parts. Uh, the first part we will see how to partition a design for synthesis. What are the partitioning guidelines? And the second part we will see the how to define what are what are what is meant by design environment and how do we set the design environment. Let's first look at. Uh, The two terminologies specific to design compiler, or I would say now they are common to all the media tools. Uh, we'll see what, uh, how, what these terminologies are and how they are used inside the tool. So uh, first, let's look at design. What do, we, what do we mean by design in the context of an media tool like synthesis design, uh, like Smart Design Compiler? So design the circuit descriptions that perform logical functions. So for example, we're We are designing an input CPU, so that is a design for for synthesis. That that is a design for simulation and so on. So designs are described in described in various formats such as DSG or Verilog. Logic level designs are represented with as set, sets of Boolean equations. Gate level so a design, let's say an 8-bit CPU, an 8-bit microprocessor. It can be represented in a Verilog SDN. After synthesis, we will get the gate level netlist. So it can also be represented in netlist format as part of it as 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 in the connected cells. So uh, a design uh, is a CPU, but the representation depends on your usage. If you want to use it for RTL simulation, you have to use the Verilog design. If you want to use it for uh, timing analysis, you have to use the netlist format. Designs can exist and be compiled independently of one another, or they can be subdesigned in a larger design. By that definition, uh, designs are either flat or hierarchical. Flat designs do not contain any subdesign; they have only one structural level. However, they may contain labyrinthine. For example, a simple design like a full adder or a half adder will contain a list of library cells. If it's a little bit, for example, it contains and gate or gate, but inside it does not contain any other design. So that is a flat design. On the other hand, all complex designs are more or less hierarchical in nature. They contain they contain one or more designs or subdesigns. Each subdesign can further contain subdesigns. So it is a kind of a design hierarchy at this level. Uh, usually, RTL is in that format. Although netlist can be flat or can be hierarchical, we will see uh, many examples during this course. Now let's come to design objects. So here's an example. So there's a design called top, which has ports A, B, input ports A, B, C, D, and clock. Output ports out, which is a bus, two-bit bus. So uh, when we talk in terms of synthesis. This top level description is called a design. The ports, the input output ports are simply called ports. But the ports of the designs which are instantiated inside the top level design are called pins. So the difference between pin and port is that ports are pins of the top level, and all the ports of Sub designs are called pins. So please be very clear about the difference between ports and pins. Ports are always when we talk about when we say something is a port, 
you mean either it's an input or an output as a coupling. A pin is usually a pin is associated with something which is inside the coupling, not at the boundary. So here there are two uh, design two sub designs contains two sub designs which we also we can also also call reference encoder and let's find u1 is an instance of encoder u4 is an instance of that let's find u2 is an instance of inb u3 again is an instance of inb so designs are top encoder and let's find please note we are not calling an inverter a design why because uh, we differentiate between design by design mean uh, say either a combination of cells or or an RTL design. Uh, I am inverter here is a standard cell component. References are again encoder H5. So now inverter now here, although uh, inverter is not called a design, it can be a reference. We see the difference between reference and design. Uh, usually uh, when you go to when you talk about other tools apart from design compiler, you will not hear term like reference it is always design that is being used again instances are the uh, instantiations of any design or reference. So, these are the descriptive more descriptive definitions. Uh, so, a design consists of instance nets ports and pins it can contain sub, sub designs in library cells. Uh, most important thing the active design the design that you are working on inside design compiler is called the current design. In fact, this is also a command. Current design is also a command. So, you want to set something to you want to set some design if you want to work on you can use the current design command. Most of the commands let us say you want to query what all ports are there in the design. So, most of such commands will work on the current design. They operate within the context of the current design. Reference is a library component or a design again see it is reference is a library component or a design. So, reference can also be used for a design that can be used as an element in building larger circuits. It can be a simple logic gate or a more complex design. One design can contain multiple occurrences of the reference and each occurrence is called an instance. Uh, the idea of reference is that it lets you optimize every cell in a single design without affecting the other design. This is called this is a unique feature that means uh, for example, see, see this design although the reference inverter is same in both the cases, but the instances u2 and u3 are different. The loading on u2 and u3 will be different, the inputs driving u2 and u3 are different. So, the design compiler will optimize u2 and u3 differently based on the, their own input and output condition. This is what it means here. Instance or cell is an occurrence of a reference, the occurrence in a circuit of a reference. Uh, each instance should be a unique name. A design obviously can contain, contain multiple instances, like we saw two instances of inverter. Each instance wants to the same reference but has a unique name to distinguish it. it is, you can also call it a cell. So, a cell a design an instance which is not hierarchical is called a lead cell. For example, in this one encoder would be more or less a complex circuit it will contain uh, few logic gates similarly H file will have some clocks. So, encoder and H file are hierarchical design they are sub designs but they are hierarchical in nature. On the other hand INV is not hierarchical. It is the there is no other hierarchy in sign that is why we call it a leaf cell. A leaf uh, you can the corollary is from a tree where a tree contains branches branches contain leaf. Leaf is the last hierarchical last non hierarchical unit that is why it is called a leaf cell. There is also a command called current instance, uh, a unique instance of a library cell is called a leaf cell. Some commands will work uh, within the context of hierarchical instance of a current design. Ports are inputs and outputs of a design, they can be input, output, or, or in out. Pins are inputs and outputs of cell within a design. So, uh, nets are wires that connect ports to pins and pins to each other. So, here uh, 
For example, this can be a wire which connects code to this design. That this uh, Q0 to INV input is a wire, again INV output to T0 is a wire, and so on. So please be very clear. Uh, if you are confused, then read more about it. Uh, mostly people are confused between port and pin. Uh, yeah, just read these descriptions here, uh, and, and maybe you can read more on the uh, design compiler manual. So this example tells uh, what is the difference between reference and a design, or clarifies other. So here, uh, the XREF is a design. It contains two references, MAN2 and multiplier. So the designs that are loaded inside design compiler are MAN2 and multiplier. Where U1, U2, and U3 are instances of MAN2, and U4 is an instance of multiplier. So MAN2 is instantiated three times, multiplier is instantiated one once. So the references of MAN2 and multiplier in the XR design are independent of same references in another design. That means if you have another design which ha again has a reference MAN2, this reference would be different from that reference. And plus, if you go down further, this instance, although in terms of functionality, RTL level it is same as U1 is same as U2 in terms of functionality, but when it goes to backend, the boundary conditions of U1, U2, and U3 are different from the other. So they will be optimized differently. Now let's uh, uh, talk about a very important concept called partitioning for synthesis. What does partitioning mean? Partitioning means dividing your design according to different design goals such that it aids synthesis and in turn it aids performance in any. So the metric here can be that let's say some design is taking a, a big complex design is taking a lot of time in synthesis. What you could do is you could partition it into smaller designs and synthesize them separately to avoid to save on runtime. Thus, it might also help you in terms of performance and everything. So, for partitioning a design effectively can enhance the synthesis result. It can reduce the compile time. Compile time here means the synthesis time and simplify uh, the constraint and script time. Partitioning affects blocks block sizes. Although design compiler has no inherent block size limit. But obviously, as we keep on increasing the complexity in RPM, the compile time uh, will keep on increasing. So uh, there, are, there are again two extremes. If we make the uh, blocks too small, if we make too many modules, then we are actually stopping design compiler from utilizing from we are creating artificial boundaries that will restrict effective optimization. Again, on the other hand, if we make very large block sizes and keep everything inside one module, uh, the run times will be more. So, uh, these are following important points which can be kept in mind for partitioning. Partitioning for design reuse, uh, keeping related formulation logic together, and so on. We will see them one by one. Let's look at the first one partitioning for design reuse. Now, what does design reuse mean? Design reuse means that, let's say, uh, I am making a circuit called a full adder. Now I know that a full adder is a very generic circuit. A lot of uh, designs, a lot of designs can use this. So I should be very careful in designing such blocks that can be reused from one design to another design, one project to another project, one application to another application. So design reuses, uh, reuse decreases time to market by reducing the design integration and testing method. So we should partition it carefully. Uh, such that such designs can be are easy to reuse. In fact, the whole industry is uh, right now design reuse is a, is a very important concept now. And chip teams uh, usually uh, pick up designs from uh, from different teams, uh, just hook them up, and they can come out with a with a chip for let's say mobile phone or a TV very quickly in a matter of uh, like let's say three or four months. So this is enabled by design view. So uh, the important points are that uh, for such design, we should thoroughly define and document the design interface. We should try and use the standardized interface interfaces wherever possible. The SDL code should be parameterized depending on let's say you are making a generic 8-bit, I mean 8-bit microprocessor. So you should uh, 
let's say uh, you uh, you should make something parametric. For example, you could make uh, the number of generic registers to be parametric. You could uh, give the flexibility to the user to have let's say eight generic registers or ten generic registers, depending on the application you use it for. So uh, LGA code should be parametric. So this is uh, this is when it comes to the planning of the design. When you're writing, when you're designing something, uh, you should first uh, analyze whether this it can be used by a different project or a different tip, and then design it accordingly. Second, very important thing, which is which uh, is applicable for at lot of levels, is keeping related combination logic together. Now, uh, by default, design compiler. Cannot optimize, cannot move logic across hierarchical boundaries. So hierarchical boundaries, I mean, across very long modules. If we talk about very long, therefore, it is very important to keep related combination logic together. If the related combination logic is together, then design compiler can use all its algorithm to algorithms to optimize the design. So for this results, uh, there are uh, two strategies. First is grouping related combination logic and its destination registers together. So when working with the complete combination path, therefore design compiler has the flexibility to merge logic, resulting in a smaller and faster design. It also simplifies timing and timing constraints. Uh, we'll see how, and it enables sequential optimization. We will see. Uh, as we uh, progress in this course, we'll see uh, how do we define the timing constraint and how does uh, keeping combination logic together with sequential counterpart will help in uh, making the job easier. Second thing is eliminate glue logic. Glue logic is the combination logic that connects blocks. For example, you have a structural design. Uh, we saw an example in, uh, in the last lecture where you have a uh, an accumulator where you have an atom and a, and a, and a register band. Uh, so uh, at the, now we should try and avoid uh, glue logic at the top level. So the top level will simply connect the designs together. And if we have glue logic at the top level, we have again have boundaries. We have sub designs. So design compiler will not optimize the glue logic effectively. Instead, we should move this logic into one of the blocks, either the source block or the target block. Now this gives uh, flexibility again to design compiler uh, to uh, optimize that. So now uh, let's let's look at this figure. So you have these three boundaries, three designs. The dotted line here tells us what are the module definitions. Now see, this is a critical path. Critical path means it is highly critical. That is, uh, uh, this is a path that has maximum delay. So this is a big combination cloud. Again, this is a big combination cloud. Now here, design compiler can optimize within this and within this, but Again, same thing. It can optimize either within this or within this. Now, if we make this into one boundary, we combine all these together, then design compiler can optimize all these three combination clouds together, and it definitely gives it more flexibility. This is a very important concept of registering block outputs. Um, this helps in simplifying the timing constraints. It's a very important uh, thing to make sure that all the outputs of your design come out of a register, and there should be minimal or no combination logic between the register and the output. We'll see how does this make our job easier when we uh, write the constraint. Uh, the drive strength on the inputs to an individual block always equals the drive strength of the average input value. We will see the uh, importance of this statement later. Just keep this in mind for now. The uh, so, for example, if we are defining input delay, if we are defining input timing constraints here, if there is a combination logic between this register and this output, then it makes a job happen. Therefore, uh, we should make sure that. There is no or minimal combination logic between output and the register itself. Right? So this is the output, and this is the register, and there is minimal or no combination logic between these two components. Uh, when we study set input delay commands and set output delay commands, then uh, we understand that 
this makes the job of defining these delays very much easier. So many there are there are few tools out there which uh, actually read in your RTL it will tell that you have these and these problems before even going to synthesis. One such tool is Spyglass. So when you actually read in your design in Spyglass, Spyglass will actually tell you whether uh, all your outputs are registered or not. Next part is by design goal. Now let's say uh, you have a one example is that you have a design, a part of a design, which is uh, very, very time critical, very much time critical. And there is some other part of the design where you are very much concerned about the area. Now, since these two have different and competing goals, it is better to keep them in different hands. Such that on one other design, you can focus on the timing part, and other design, you can focus on the area part. So, uh, one example here is so. Uh, so the idea is to isolate the non-critical speed constraint from the critical speed constraint logic. We will see in advanced synthesis concept how can we actually take a small part of the design and tell DC to work more on it in terms of area and in terms of power. So one was the, uh, so the earlier one was a design goal, now this was a compile technique. Now, um, when we see, when we look at the compile command, the command that actually performs the optimization, uh, it has a lot of options available. One such option is uh, uh, enables it to uh, actually use multiple stages in the design as opposed to flattening the design. One in one. Uh, so when we uh, increase the number of stages, we are increasing the uh, we are Decreasing the area but increasing the performance. When we flatten the design a lot, we are increasing the performance and reducing the area. So these are again two competing goals. So uh, one example is that highly structured logic such as array detection circuitry, which uses lot of XORs, is better suited to structuring. But random logic is better suited to flattening. So since these two are different type of goals. These type of design should be kept separately in separate hierarchy. Other uh, guideline is keeping shareable resources together. So design compiler is actually pretty good at sharing resources uh, such as adders or multipliers. Uh, but resource sharing can only occur if the resources belong to the same value of all this long. Although even if they belong to different all this blocks, they can you can tell design compiler to to re, to, use, to actually do resource sharing, but that's again a, a separate set of commands. So to make design design compiler work out of the box for you, it is best to actually do the resource sharing in the RTL itself by including them in the same always box. Now here is the uh, one example of coding. In the, in the first part of the code, A plus B is going to one pin of the mark, C plus B is going to another pin of the mark. The CTL selects which goes to the register input, either A plus B or C plus B. See the second example. Now in this the RTL is arranged in such a manner that the mark here is moved ahead so that it selects the CTL selects between either A and C or B and D and then there is only one arrow. Obviously the second uh, the second instance is a better RTL design such that the resource sharing is done right at the RTL level. So that is, uh, even if uh, we code in, in the we code as given in the example one here uh, in case of unshared resources, if these A, B, C, and D, if these two additions are done in the same on this block, then design compiler will give you this kind of an input. It will know that it can share resources. So that it will it will move the marks ahead and replace these two adders by a single one. Keeping user defined resources with the logic they drive. Now there can be a few complex uh, blocks in your design which are user defined functions, procedures, or macro cells. Now whenever there are such cases, and obviously design compiler will not automatically create multiple instances of these. 
since it doesn't understand the complexity is it doesn't let design it if the function is not simple for example there is a very special memory now this this special memory can never be installed it can only be instantiated so it should be the part of your rtl system for instance instance now design compiler will not create multiple instances of this to resolve any timing problem or any loading problem so what we should do is that we should keep this resources together with the logic they try and that later if we find that let's say you have one user defined resource here and it drives it drives let's say a, a net called parity error that is a sign out of that has a large sign let's say sign out of 10 now if we keep this in the same hierarchy and if we later realize that this um, complex resource is not able to drive such a load we could create multiple instances easily and split the load Uh, this is a again a, a slightly more complex example. It is not uh, you not come come across this problem very early in the design stage, uh, or when you are doing the simple RTL coding by by learning learning the process and such. This is a more advanced problem since it involves some complex resources like special memory or memory. Again, isolating special function. This is more applicable for bigger designs. Or even at the chip level, where uh, you would want to separate your coordinates and logic, your paths, the boundary scan, any asynchronous of logic. So all these different types of logic should be in separate hierarchies. So this is how a chip is made. You will need a chip to have a top level that has separate paths. A clock generation logic will be a separate module. Boundary scan will be a separate module. Any asynchronous logic will be a separate module. Again, core logic would be divided into different functions. There would there might be a CPU, a video processing unit, a peripheral unit, and so on. So that was all about uh, design partitioning. Uh, till now, this concept was only theoretical. But when you start uh, coding, you would start appreciating the uh, the value of each of those principles uh, uh, later in the flow. So if you miss, let's say if you do not register your output, you will find at the later stage that you are having problems in the uh, final time condition. So then you will go back and probably register the output. So it's good to know these concepts beforehand so that you can actually uh, use them in practice. Now let's look at uh, let's uh, look at the optimization priority. Uh, I stressed the fact earlier that design goes often something. For example, area, timing, and power. They are conflicting design goals. The optimization engine of design compiler must resolve conflict, and therefore the priority comes into picture. So, DC design compiler priority is first. It will focus on fixing DRC. Only when it fixes DRC, it knows that it the timing. It can it can believe in the timing. So, DRC is always number one. Next comes the timing. Obviously, uh, uh, the design should be performance, even if it has a slightly more power or anything. Then comes the power, and last comes the energy. This is the default priority. These these priorities can be modified with set cost priority, but it's not a very popular choice because this priority is very logical in nature. How this is based on the facts of how designers perceive their All designers want the design to be. Uh, one example: uh, any 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 processor that works for a handheld device, obviously uh, uh, the RC has to be meeting first, or the design needs to be met before we can talk about timing. Then the most important factor for a processor chip is the speed. So, if you are targeting a one gigahertz processor, it should meet one gigahertz, and therefore it should meet timing as one gigahertz. Now, since it's a handheld device like a mobile, power becomes very important. So, it's a battery operated device. So, next comes power. Obviously, area is also very important because it should be smaller in area. But area is secondary when compared to power and timing. So uh, I have not seen many people using playing with such cost priority. 
it is good to know that this priority can be changed, can be modified. Now, before talking about timing, so on the previous slide we saw that design compiler will first fix VRC and then go on to fix timing. So, uh, what are the factors that affect timing? Constraints that we describe uh, and delays available from register to register, input to register, register to output, and so on. <coughs> we will see a lot more of this in the next lecture. But more important is the first important thing is the conditions under which the delays are calculated are do not are not described by these constraints. For example, when you define a clock or you define an input delay or an output delay, these do not talk about the sufficient and necessary conditions under which delay calculation would be reliable. Because all all the delays depend on all the delays of the design depend on the capacitance. For example, the delay of a gate depends on the capacitance the gate sees on its output. That capacitance will be comprised of the inherent gate capacitance plus the net capacitance plus the final capacitance plus it also depends on the input transmission time. It depends on what is the voltage, what is the temperature, what is the process we are talking about and so on. So, now in this lecture we are focusing on the second thing. We are focusing on the environment condition. This is what I mean by the environment condition. So, we look at all these things. We look at how to provide the input constraints, input environment conditions. We will see how to set the operating conditions. We will see how to since synthesis at the synthesis level we do not have the information about the nets since the design is not routed, not yet placed and routed. We will see how to estimate the wire, the interconnect data. We will see the output loading conditions, how to set them. This is called all these conditions combined together that is the operating conditions, the interconnect data, the input boundary conditions and output boundary conditions combined together is called the design moment. So, so we look at uh, the four cases of how to specify input transition, how to specify output loading, how to set the PVT condition, how to set the parasitic condition. Let us first look at the uh, this part the operating conditions. So, the operating conditions uh, I have also gone through this earlier let me just quickly go through it again. The operating conditions include the following parameters process voltage and temperature. These are not fixed values these are everything is a range for example, process is again a range from slow slow to fast fast voltage is again again a range which is typically uh, minus 10 percent of a target VDD to plus 10 percent of a target VDD. Temperature is again a range it could be from 0 degree C to 125 C. So, the chip is intended to operate in all such ranges and in all the possible combinations. So, the process variation is a, it accounts for the deviation in the semiconductor fabrication process. Not every transistor, not every PMOS, not every PMOS, not every PMOS, not every MOS on that chip. There are now billions of PMOS and MOS on the chip, and not every one is expected to behave in a similar manner. Some will be faster, some will be slow. So this is this effect, this physical effect is modeled by the process variation. Usually, it is treated as a percentage variation in the performance calculation. So you could say that one way of modeling it puts you could say that. Uh, let us say the typical speed of uh, um, the, the inverter, let us say the typical value of inverter is x. So, the worst case delay will be 20 percent more. So, the worst case delay would be 1.2. Although, this is a very simplistic model, and uh, the present day models are much more complex. Uh, supply voltage variation uh, it can vary from the ideal value during day to day operation, it, it models that physical effect. Uh, often a complex calculation using a shift in threshold voltage is employed, but uh, again a simplistic model would be to uh, to make sure that the chip works at minus 10 percent of the for example. 
Temperature variation is unavoidable in every day operation of a design. Each part, not all parts of the system, will have same temperature. And uh, for example, you're using a mobile phone. If you, if you talk for half an hour, the temperature will keep on increasing. The temperature of the chip. If you keep your phone on stand standby, the temperature will decrease. So the temperature depends on the usage mode. Plus, different again the, the in, a, in a mobile phone, the CPU, the, the processor chip, the processor part keeps on working all the time. So it it will get a higher temperature reading compared to the, the video decoder part because video decoder part will only work when you are watching a video. So uh, if this physical effect is uh, is uh, modeled uh, using temperature variation, uh, so it could again be a linear uh, linear model or a, or a much more complex model. So the idea is that uh, for synthesis, since synthesis is uh, the idea is to optimize the design for maximum performance. So we should choose the corner in such a way that it is the worst conditions for the operation of the chip. So when we talk about operating condition, we should synthesize it at a slow corner because now at, at a slow corner, slow process corner, the delays will be more. So it will be a limiting factor in terms of performance. Again, we should choose a higher temperature in, in most of the technologies. I say most because some technologies uh, have a negative temperature effect where when the temperature is less, the delays are more. So but let's not worry about that. In most of the technologies, higher temperature means higher delay. So we should choose a higher temperature. Again, we should choose a lower voltage. Why? Because lower voltage means slower devices. So typically, almost always, you would choose slow corner, high temperature, and low voltage. If your design is optimized and meets the performance criteria in this corner, it will meet the performance criteria in any corner. So most logic libraries. So when you use your, when you start a synthesis, you will see that. The Synopsys 90 nanometer generic library will have predefined set of operating conditions. So, uh, how to know what operating conditions are? Uh, first, first you, we should have the library read inside the uh, inside design compiler. So, if you want to just see what operating conditions are, you can follow the example. You can say read lib, read file, and you can read the DB. Then you can uh, type a command called report lib. Report lib will tell you, it will give you a report in this format, it will tell you what all operating conditions are available, it will tell you the process factor, this is the factor that is multiplied by the delay part, it will tell you the temperature and the voltage, it will tell you what is the interconnect model, we will talk that later. Again if your library is already loaded, you can use a command called list libs, it will tell you what all libraries are there, then you can again do a report lib on that particular library. So now the command to set operating condition is this. Set operating conditions. WCCOM here is the operating condition name that is included in the library. And you tell a design compiler what library is this operating condition in. This is the way you set operating conditions. Again, the key thing is here is to remember that you always choose the worst case corner, worst case delay corner for synthesis. Next comes the interconnect part. Now, uh, at synthesis level, we do not have any knowledge. There is no accurate interconnect data. Anything has to be an estimate. So, one type, one model to estimate uh, interconnect is called a Violet model. It is a very popular model. Violet model is the simplest method of estimation. So, that we call it WLM. WLM gets a rough value of the total wire cap based on the size of the chip and the fan of the chip. So for each net, now this data, this WLM, so what DC will do is for each net, if we go to this WLM and see what this net, uh, so there will be different viable models. Uh, so it will see that, okay, for a particular fan out, it will go to that listing. So that listing will contain, it will tell you the typical value of the capacitance for different values of fan out. For example, if the fan out of 10, it will tell what the cap is, what the typical cap. The design compiler will pick, will pick up that cap value from there. It is not accurate, it is just an estimate. 
So for each net wire load model obtains two values resistance value and a capacitor value. WLMs are not specific to each design and based on statistical averages. So what happens in the industry is typically that let's say we choose a particular technology and we choose the standard cell library vendor. That vendor based on the history of the devices will give a set of WLMs for that particular technology. And the WLM for one technology will be different than WLM for other technology because the resistance and capacitance value they change from technology to technology. So now, uh, now uh, one is what what wire load model to choose. Second is what is the mode. So uh, design compiler supports three modes for determining which wire load model to use for nets. That cross hierarchical boundary. Now, most in most of the cases, your design will have hierarchy. So, design compiler has, has three WLM modes. One is the top. In this case, for each net, DC will simply use the wire load model that is used by the top level of the design. The tool ignores any wire load model set on the lower designs with the set wire load model command. You can use the stop mode if you are planning to flatten the design. If you are planning that the complete design, all the hierarchies will be removed after implement, then we can use this. Obviously, this is the most crude form of pilot mode. Second is enclosed. So now DC will look at the uh, net and it will look for the design that completely encloses this net completely. And it will use the wire load model for that design. We you can use enclosed if the design has similar, similar logical and physical hierarchy. Third is segmented. This is the most accurate or most accurate estimate, I would say. So it will uh, divide the net into segments, and for each segment, use the wire load mode for the design that contains this net. Let us look at the figure to understand this better. Now, we are talking about this net. So, let us say there are three wire load modes available, three or four wire load modes available to us 50 cross 50, 40 cross 50, 40, 20 cross 20, 30 cross 30. Each of these wire load modes, as the name suggests, depends on the area. So, the most popular implementation is that you have different wire load models for different areas. So, let us say your chip area is 20 cross 20, you will use the wire load model based on 20 cross 20. <coughs> 50 cross 50 wire load model will have more resistance and more capacitance compared to a 20 cross 20 wire load model. Now, when we talk about this net, if we set the wire load mode to be top, DC will still choose a 50 cross 50 model for this net since we said it is top. For any type in the design, it will not choose 20 cross 20, 30 cross 30, or 40 cross 30. Obviously, this is more sensitive meter, and it is very simple meter as the implementation goes. When we go to enclose, we go to slightly more accurate implementation. It will see, it will look for the smallest design that encloses this net. 20 cross 20 does not enclose this net completely, 30 cross 30 also does not. 40 cross 40 encloses this net completely. So these are three segments 1, 2, and 3. So it will choose the wire load mode to be the wire load model to be 40 cross 40 if the mode is enclosed. Again for the segmented one, it will choose 20 cross 20 for this segment of the net. For this segment, it will choose 40 cross 40 for this segment and 30 cross 40 for this segment. So first you choose what is the wire load model. Usually it will be area based or fan out based, however. And second, you choose the mode. So most logic libraries have predefined wire load models. You can open up your 1996 from Office library and verify this. You can use report lib. Report lib will also tell what is the wire load model. The report will be something like this, um, the one given on the on the right hand side. It will tell what all wire load models are available. It will tell, for example, here 0, 05 plus 0, 05 is one wire load model. It has some values of R, C, and flow. It tells for what fan out what is the length. 
also it gives a it gives a automatic selection of parallel model based on image. This is one nice feature in the parallel model where you could have you could specify the max area and tell uh, the tool that for a block which is up to this area, use this parallel model. Between this and this, use this parallel model. So there will be different parallel models here, and the tool can take choose based on the area. For hierarchical design. What violet model will it apply depends on the mode which is either top in close or segmented. This slide here tells about what are the commands. So, the default violet model library attribute defines the default violet model for the uh, library. As you saw an example, this lab some libraries support automatic area based violet selection. So, uh, it uses that feature and it will select a violet model based on the total cell area. You can we can turn this off auto violet selection if you want to specify the violet ourselves since automatic violet selection can be the runtime uh, since for uh, let's say your design has lot of hierarchies many of these these hierarchies will be small so it will pick up small violet model again for larger blocks it will pick larger area based violet model so it has lot many different kinds of violet models for different parts of the design this can increase in runtime. If you want to set this off, you can use this variable. The library can also define a default violet mode. Mode, if the mode is not defined, design compiler will choose the top mode top. So these two commands, set violet model and set violet mode, these two can be used to select these explicitly. You can say what violet model to use, or and what violet mode to use. So the violet model we choose for a design. Depends on how the design is implemented. Okay. So it is best to look look at the uh, technology library supplied by the semiconductor vendor to define determine the best viable model. The report design and report timing commands can be used to see what is the viable model used. We will see more of these commands later in the, in the lecture. Uh, to remove the viable model, we can use this command report viable model, remove viable model. Now, uh, all the commands I am discussing in these lectures. Uh, Please go back uh, to your example design, whatever you are synthesizing um, uh, during your uh, your experiment, and use these commands to verify that you use the command reportly, for example, to verify that your uh, standard cell library indeed contains some viable models. Use these commands, uh, check viable models, set viable mode, uh, do a lot of experiments till you are comfortable with the control. So, uh, these are the assignments for uh, any any command I discuss. Discuss, please go back, see the help, see the man page, experiment with it you know, to learn about it more. So we saw uh, the operating condition part, which defines the PVP of the design. We saw how to estimate the interconnect data. Now uh, the two things remaining are the input boundary and the output boundary. So let's look at the input boundary first. So the most important thing regarding input boundary is that we should model something called the input transition. So for modeling input transition, uh, there are two ways. One is that we tell we see that each of my input has some transition, some positive transition. If we do not specify this, the DC will assume the transition to be zero, and it is wrong. It is optimistic because any uh, your design will be driven by some cell and the transition will never be zero. It will be greater than zero for all the practical cases. So, or the second case, we can choose, we can tell design compiler that I am expecting my input to be driven by this cell. In that case, DC will use the uh, timing characteristics of this cell. So, even if the input transition here is zero, there will be some transition here. There will be some transition at the input. Why? Because we specified, we told DC that there is a driving cell here. What is the effect? Rise and fall transitions on the input port affect the cell delay of the gates. So, transitions here will affect the delay calculation of the combination of the cell. Therefore, it is very important to accurately model transition times of all inputs. How do we do that? Two very famous commands. By default, DC will assume zero drive resistance on input ports. 
means infinite drive strength drive resistance so the, the term drive strength is reciprocal of drive resistance so zero drive resistance means infinite drive strength that means that core can drive any gap or any resistance which is not obviously practical to set realistic drive strength we use one of the following commands set driving cell or set input function we use the set driving cell command to specify the drive characteristic now we have to tell for example when you use this set driving cell command we tell this is that i am expecting this input let's say to be driven by a perfect core from this library so dc uh, so this command is compatible with all dna models including nndm and psy dna model model so this command associates the library pin with an input code so that the delay calculators can accurately model the drive compatibility of an external drive what we did here is that we told dc that this this particular type of cell for example a buffet code drives my input now dc will use the characteristics of this cell to calculate a reasonable transition time of the input or if we do not know if we cannot estimate what kind of cell will drive your input we directly give a value some value at set input only what will that value be we we'll see now we see the output boundary so the uh, the capacitive load on the output port affects the transition time obviously if you assume the load to be zero here it is not realistic and it will affect the optimization in this part so the central for example this clock is driving the q is driving the output directly output is directly and we assume a zero load load at a this can affect the optimization of this cell this sequential cell since the boundary conditions are not accurate to be how do we model this we model this using a set load command directly we tell uh, dc that my output out drives for example a cap of 20 cm out so this is the command set load the cap value the units will again come from the library and the output code by default if you don't do this it will assume zero capacitor load and it is not correct it is not accurate so this how does the cell for example uh, you have this the sequential cell you have let's say three different type of drive strength in your library x1 x2 and x3 based on the load here if the load is zero here and you don't specify set load dc will assume a zero load it will use an x1 clock x1 drive strength clock however let's say when you go to back end or somebody else uses your design and it connects let's say four inverter there now this x1 will not help the transition will be very very bad because it will not be able to drive this much this much load so so it is good to estimate that and apply that estimated value as set load so that dc what it will do now it will maybe upsize it to the x2 or x4 this will enable the guy who is using your design the guy who uses your design will see good transition numbers coming out of it right now the question is that i have my design i do not know what happens at the input boundary or the output boundary i am not aware of them i do not know in what conditions my design would be condition c input and output boundary condition not the operating condition i know the operating condition operating conditions are more like this thing but i do not know what kind of cells will drive my input i do not know what kind of fan out my output will drive how do we estimate in such cases estimation is called load load budget this estimation is called load budget so how do we create a load budget at the inputs at the input we assume that there will be a deep driver why because this is the worst case. we should be prepared for the worst case now so you could assume that a buff x a buffer of the lowest strain or an inverter of the lowest strain is driving my input and you can set 
driving cell accordingly or if you do not want to set a driving cell you can apply the transient number now what transient number you would apply you would apply remember the lookup table we saw in the library page there a buffer for example an x1 buffer has a maximum level of transition you could apply that maximum transition at the input so that will be the worst case transition for this input so as you know these cell driving the inputs to be conservative or set a high value the maximum value of the input of the transition from from the lookup table of a lab Uh, limit the input capacitance of input port. Uh, ideally, I would say that if you have done the job well in the first phase, the second is not entirely needed. This is very important. Estimate the number of other major blocks the output may have to drive. So the output estimate. If you cannot estimate, then what do you do? You apply a load here, which is typically the maximum load your combination cell here can drive. So, for example, you have three clocks: X1, X2, X4. Choose what maximum load your X4 can drive, and set load that. Set load here. That's why. What DC will do now? It will. It will. It will know that okay, you are driving this much load, and it will always choose X4. The drive strength four of that of the resistor that is driving you. So you are on the safe side. so uh, now what do these uh, these constraints do so the input constraint is the transition time to let the time compiler correctly calculate the uh, delay of the logic here at the input boundary the an output load will enable the design compiler to instantiate a higher drive cell here at this point so you are safe on both the input side and the output side. i'll summarize again what all uh, things you need to specify correctly the op the operating of the design environment so this is a figure so we saw how to set the operating condition operating condition sets the pgp of the design the process would be the method of design always choose the worst case we saw how to estimate the interconnect uh rnc values we use set valor model we use a valor model that is part of a library most in most of the cases also there is something called custom valor model so for a particular chip your uh, back end team or library team can come up with a custom valor model which is specific to your chip uh, this is again a separate topic altogether but there is one such case so you can you can use that custom valor model you use uh, commands like set driving cell or set input transition don't worry about the set drive command uh, set drive is not used uh, extensively now is either set driving cell or set input transition at the input side although you could also set load at the input but it uh, but it will help again so set driving cell and set load go together you can set the driving cell and you can set the load so that will uh, help dc in calculating the transition time at the input or you could use set input transition directly again at the output you either set load or you can also set fan out load if you know what kind of fan out is going to drive set fan out load set load is a is a capacitor number set fan out load is a simply a number that how many fan out will it drive so uh, in the next lecture we we'll now we we'll look at the timing constraints the clock input delay and output delay Thank you.